Welcome to Craftlit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 549, Vroom! This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by you. Thank you. Well, hello for you. I am freezing. I apologize if you can hear my heater going. It is really cold in the basement this morning. I don't know why it is any colder than it was before, but indeed it is. So I'll sacrifice a lot for y'all. (laughs) <laughs> my toes, I am not losing to frostbite. I draw, I draw the line at losing appendages. <laughs> However, fingers and toes aside, I learned something last night that rocked my world. I hope it rocks yours too. And I, I didn't even remember to tell this to the Thursday night Zoom crew. I am so sorry, guys. But it was great to see you again last night. And of course, if you are interested in showing up on a Thursday night, There's a link in the show notes so that you can register, get the link, and even if the link says it is past its sell-by date at some future point, it's not. It'll keep working. Everybody's been using the same link for almost a year. And a year, to me, is seven inches of hair I measured. I started the pandemic with very short hair, and now it's seven inches longer than it was. (sighs) Anyway, the cool thing that I learned last night is... I was looking for a recipe for something that I could cook while I was working (laughs) because Thursday nights are complicated. My husband, Andrew, has a Zoom chat with his friends from college. My two boys have other things that they are committed to doing on Thursday nights. And I have my Zoom crew and often work. So we need something that's going to sit there and be warm and easy to eat, but not something that we all have to eat at the same time or has to be ready at the same time only. I found a recipe for a French onion, French bean soup. Well, everybody in this household loves French onions, and I had some massive Vidalia onions to use. If you are not in the States, Vidalia is a county in Georgia, I believe, that happens to have really unique soil and some very smart marketing type of a farmer figured out that his onions were really sweeter than most onions. And they seem to be uniquely sweet. And so if he marketed them as sweet Vidalia onions, he could clean up in the onion biz, as it were. And he did. And now there are lots of places that claim to have sweet onions, but they can't claim that they're Vidalia onions any more than you could claim that you made champagne in, let's say, Pennsylvania. The grapes have to come from the proper region of France. They've got basically a trademark lock on on the term. Same with Vidalia onions. We had some and they were big and they're good. And so what I did is I sliced up my onions nice and thin. Some I left in rings. Some I did half rings. Some I cut up a little smaller than that. And then I melted a quarter cup of butter and I had three big Vidalias and I think three smaller regular yellow onions. Sliced all those up, melted in the microwave or on the stovetop, just melted before. Uh, About a quarter cup of butter, maybe a little bit more. And then I took that, I poured it into the bottom of a crock pot, put the crock pot on high, dumped the onions in, stirred everything around for a little while to get the butter all over everything that looked like an onion. And then I walked away with it on high for three hours plus. It wound up being more like three and a half, maybe even four hours all told to get everything caramelized because I used about double the amount of onion that the recipe recommended because <laughs> can't get too many caramelized onions in our family. It caramelized the onions really nicely over those three or four hours. The house smelled great. I texted out instructions to all the men in the house. Anytime you walk past the crock pot, please pick up the spoon and stir the onions. And everybody did. And as a consequence, we had this French onion soup last night 
Because the last couple hours, you dump in your stock, dump in white cannelloni beans, rinsed, rinsed and drained, um, teaspoon of oregano, two teaspoons of thyme. I tossed in a few bay leaves because why not? Salt and pepper. Yeah, I think that's it. Honestly, that's <laughs> that's it. If we were going to do it again, I think I would put the salt and pepper actually in with the onions to cook it around in there for longer. But wow, super easy, super not expensive, super good. Oh my gosh. So it all told everything cooked on high for about four hours for the onions, two-ish hours for the beans and spices. And then I just put the thing on warm and it, it stayed beautifully palatable until forever. So I am never going to spend hours of my life caramelizing onions on the stovetop ever again. I'm just going to pre-cut a mess load of onions. And Sunday night, I am going, or Sunday afternoon, really, because it's a long time. I will caramelize onions for the week and then freeze some and refrigerate in Tupperware others. And then everybody can have their darn onions whenever they want. Huh. I hope that does you good as well. <laughs> it made me very happy. I have no idea what Jane Austen would have thought of French onion soup <laughs> or, or a crock pot or caramelized onions at all. But I do know this. Human people have not changed a whole lot since Jane Austen's day. Oh, sure. Our language has changed some. But the two chapters we are listening to today goes a long way towards confirming my belief that really, it's like putting a lipstick on a pig, <laughs> going back in time and thinking that people wore fancy dresses and things like that, and therefore must have been classier, better people than us. <laughs> nah, -uh. nope, not even a little bit. And boy, today just absolutely nails that fact. Here's why. You are going to hear Catherine and Isabella chatting with each other. And I'm, I'm going to give you some specifics, but just in general, listen to Isabella's speech. We don't get a lot of characters like her in Jane Austen books. And I'm not going to use words to describe her pejoratively. Instead, I'm going to try and do exactly what Jane Austen does and say, listen to how she uses language. And how many times she uses the same words or phrases to describe people or items. And then listen to her in contrast to Catherine in the beginning. And then listen to Catherine starting to mimic Isabella throughout these two chapters. She doesn't do it all the time, but when she does do it, you'll, you'll see what's going on and you'll see why. So that's number one. Number two, we will meet some men in today's chapters. Not Mr. Tilney. I'm just telling you up front right now, we're not going to get another romantic, fun, witty scene about Mr. Tilney today. What we are going to get is proof positive that even though horses and carriages didn't make vroom vroom noises back then, <laughs> if guys could have painted racing stripes on the sides of their horses and or carriages, they totally would have. I'm not joking. We're going to meet a character who is so iconically knicky from Greece. It's just fabulous. Oh my gosh. So there are, there are actually some specifics. And once again, Jane Austen, out of today's two chapters, I think has three different entries into the OED of the first time a phrase has been used. <laughs> oh, they're pretty certain she actually made up some terms or, or she's just such a, she was such, just such a good listener of people and the way they spoke to each other and just, you know, had that kind of steel trap memory so that when she needed to draw on those memories, she was able to pull them out and therefore create really remarkably lifelike people. Obviously, lifelike enough to have us still be reading her books today with glee. <laughs> with lots of glee. All right, so 
things to know so you can get the jokes. Here we go. Actually, the first thing isn't a joke. It's just a color that doesn't get referred to very often these days, at least not in the States. It's coquelicot. C-O-Q-U-E-L-I-C-O-T. It is the French name for wild poppies. So it's that bright red-orange coquelicot color. So if you aren't familiar with that word, now you are. But here's where jokes come in. The Mysteries of Udolpho, written by Anne Radcliffe. There is an interesting error in the original printed text of Northanger Abbey. And it's hard to say whether it was Jane Austen having a go at Anne Radcliffe, who wrote The Mysteries of Udolpho, or if it was a printer's error. Either way, Anne Radcliffe, her last name Radcliffe, is spelled with an E at the end. And throughout one of these two chapters, it is spelled in the text, the original text anyway, without an E. I don't know if she meant to do it. If she did, it's kind of funny. She's just knocking old Anne down a peg by taking away her fancy E. Either way, The Mysteries of Udolpho, a story about a girl named Emily who winds up getting imprisoned by an evil, manipulative man. She winds up imprisoned in Udolpho. Udolpho is the name of this Gothic mansion place where she is imprisoned. And she becomes completely obsessed with something that looks like it must be a painting, but there's a black veil hanging over the painting. I think the painting's in an alcove, and so the veil's actually kind of hanging in front of the alcove. And at one point, Emily sneaks into the room where this veil, etc., exists. She goes, she lifts it. She lifts just the corner of it, you know, kind of thing. Looks behind it and immediately falls into a dead faint. Anne Radcliffe was evidently a genius at doing this kind of thing because it takes until the very end of the book for you to find out why Emily faints. She strings people along. This veil thing is like, oh, gasp moment. She strings you along for hundreds of pages until she finally tells you what was there. And it's ghastly. You want me to spoil it for you? All right. If you don't want to hear, skip ahead about a minute. Here's what it is. This is a very brief version. Uh, she lifts up the veil. It looks like she has uncovered an alcove with a dead body extended at length with a, a shroud over it, but not covering everything. And so you can see the skeletal remains and the desiccated skin on the face. And there are worms in the hands and in the, in the face. And then you are told that really it's, it's like a waxy figure that's been created and, and posed and painted up to look this way. And you can listen again now. It's been about a minute. I think it's one of the things that made Anne Radcliffe so popular was that she could string you along because you thought something really, truly horrible was going on. And then she'd give you that moment of recognition of the horrible. It's a pretty ghastly description. And then take one step back and say, well, it wasn't really what it looked like. What it was was a waxworks or what it was was a painting or what it was was not your imagination all by itself, but it was your imagination making something that looked bad. Your imagination actually made it be bad when it wasn't in fact, in fact real. It's a pretty good trick. And as before, uh, when you hear laundry lists of books that are read by young women at this time period, they are real. They are a actual books. A lot of the ones that are mentioned in this week's chapters actually came out of the German tradition, which means they would have been similar to books and stories that Washington Irving was reading or had been reading. So you, you get some of the same sensibilities. I think E.A. Hoffman, I think he was writing around this time period too. They, all these stories seem to have that kind of common thread. The dark side of the Nutcracker is specifically what I'm thinking of, but I'm talking off the top of my head right now because I didn't actually check that before I started recording. 
and I'm not going to right now. Here we go. So we've got all these spooky stories, Germanic in bent at least. We have a reference to netting. It is not a mis mispronunciation. It is not knitting, K-N-I-T-T-I-N-G. It's netting, N-E-T-T-I-N-G. I went and looked this up on the web, and then I did some more digging into books. And apparently, it's kind of like a cross between knoll bending, where you create loops into a row of loops below. You create loops that you just leave open. You, you needle create these loops. And then you go back needling into those loops and create and leave other loops. Half the time, what I found sounded like that. And then the other half the time, it sounded like netting, like actually making a net. However, the reason why I'm hesitating in saying that it was quite definitely just making a net, so somebody would be like making netting for a veil. The reason why I hesitate is because the reference in the book is someone is netting herself the sweetest cloak you can conceive. Cloak sounds to me a little bit heavier. It's not a veil. You know what I mean? So later we'll hear about a, a reference to a muff and tippet. Those were often fur. A fur muff would be this uh, cylinder of fur that you could put your hands in to keep them warm. They work. A tippet would just be a, a shoulder covering, kind of half scarf, half epaulette, <laughs> kind of also often made of fur. They came as a pair sometimes, muffin tippet pair. So the, the way netting is being used here and the way it was referred to in a couple of Jane Austen's letters makes it sound like it's more substantial than making a veil. One of her letters refers to somebody she knows netting herself a gown. Now, unless she's Lady Godiva, I can't figure out how that could be net like veil net. So I, I was out of ideas. I went down this rabbit hole for a while. Anybody who knows what the heck they're talking about, please give us a ring at 206-350-1642 or email heather at craftlit.com because I'm curious now. There's going to be a reference, uh, several references actually, to a book called, and this is the title of the book, Sir Charles Grandison, G-R-A-N-D-I-S-O-N. This is a book that was very popular at the time. Jane Austen loved this book. It was very detailed. And in fact, Henry Fielding, who wrote Tom Jones, by the way, Tom Jones is pretty much, from what I understand, a direct parody of this book, Sir Charles Grandison. He, he once wrote how, and this is a quote, how a lady of the Edinburgh circle, who loved in her old age to have novels read to her as she sat in her elbow chair, used to prefer, for that purpose, Sir Charles Grandison beyond any other work of fiction, because, said she, should I drop asleep in the course of the reading, I am sure when I awake I shall have lost none of the story, but shall find the party where I left them conversing in the cedar parlor. Evidently not much happens in the book. Sir Charles Grandison. But Jane Austen, we know, read and reread it. And her nephew, who wrote a biography of her, indicated that it was her good taste <laughs> that kept her from writing a book like Sir Charles Grandison. However, I think it was her brother who said it was her good taste and her sister that kept her away from doing that. So it's long and slow, and you will hear at least one dig about it. There is a phrase it does not signify. This was a colloquialism. It wasn't really slangy, but it was definitely of its time. And it just means it doesn't make any difference. Saying, but it does not signify means, well, it doesn't matter. Not in a necessarily pejorative way, but just in a, yeah, no, that, no, everything's fine. It doesn't, that doesn't matter. In today's chapters, you will very likely hear moments where Isabella appears to be absolutely portraying herself as the heroine of a novel and trying to cast Catherine as her trusty sidekick. There are things she is going to expect Catherine to do that Catherine is just not going to pick up on. 
partly because Catherine is just too honest and good at this point to understand what Isabella's hinting at or doing. But the other reason is because Catherine is her own heroine in her own novel, in her mind. And yet, time and time again, we will have indicated to us, yeah, except she's not, because she doesn't do these things. She's not silly in that way. She does not overly dramatize everything. She is not always figuring out a coquettish way to get a guy to notice her. She's just her, which is kind of nice. You will hear Isabella refer to Edgar's buildings. This is with, with an apostrophe S, Edgar's apostrophe S buildings. At the time, it was actually a street reference because Bath grew so quickly at one point in the late 1700s or mid 1700s that they, they kind of couldn't keep up with street naming. And so streets wound up being connected to the buildings on them because all of the buildings were put up at the same time, kind of like at the Crescent. Everything was built between a certain period or between certain year range. A lot of stuff changed in Bath. In fact, there is when Jane Austen started writing this book when she was much younger, there's a street that didn't exist at that time, which is prominent in persuasion. A street didn't exist when she first started writing. That's kind of cool. So Edgar's buildings were at the top of Milson Street, M-I-L-S-O-N. Milson Street is still there. The street where Edgar's buildings were is now George's Street, I think. And Edgar's buildings are still there. In fact, one is for sale for a mere 600,000 pounds. So <laughs> I'm going to go snap that sucker up. It's beautiful. Not a surprise. At the top of Milson Street at the time... That wasn't necessarily the classiest of locations, but it was still nice enough. And to get to the pump room, you would have to walk through the churchyard into the pump room yard, and it would be an excellent way to see and be seen, for one thing. Milson Street further down is a, an interesting bridge between the older riverfront parts of Bath and the newer, more recently built and built up section of Bath at the time. So Milson Street was one of the streets where there were lots of, still are, lots of shops. It's very pretty. So if you were going to take a place there, you would be in rooms above the shops. They would be very centrally located, kind of an active part of town. Kind of like, now I was going to say it's kind of like being in the West Village where lots of things are happening all the time, but probably not. It wouldn't have been that bohemian of reference at this point. Anyway, further down on Milson Street would have been a little bit closer to the action, a little bit more desirable location to be hanging out. Then in chapter seven, I should remind you a guinea is a pound and a shilling. So a pound and then a 20th of a pound. Guineas were used to describe how much something relatively inexpensive, and I'm putting that in air quotes, would cost. Whereas pounds would be like big numbers. How many pounds does Mr. Darcy have? That kind of number. So guineas, I'm reminding you what, that, what they are. Guineas, I'm also reminding you for reference. Jane Austen sold her piano for, what was it, eight guineas? It's a lot of money. You're going to hear about a lot more than that getting thrown around. And I will talk about that a little bit on the flip side as well. You will hear a reference to Cheap Street. Cheap Street was not pejorative. Cheap just meant you could buy things there. So it wasn't a, it wasn't a knock against what kinds of things were being sold on the street, necessarily. Devoir, D-E-V-O-I-R-S, is just paying your respects, being, being respectful and civil and polite. However, you are also going to hear shortly thereafter of someone doing a bow and scrape. You may have heard of bowing and scraping before. My image of why it was called that was so wrong. A bow and a scrape is if you bow quite low and one leg goes out behind you, it scrapes the ground behind you. It's not that little half bow from the waist. It's 
going down a bit. It's putting some effort into the bow. However, if someone is being described as doing a bow and scrape, it is probably not described with the word scrape because you looked really good doing it. It probably didn't look like you were wearing that action particularly well or gracefully. Just saying. And then we get into the cars, I mean carriages and horses. Here are some things to know. And I, I know I've mentioned at least one of these before. A gig is a light two-passenger one horse carriage. Sporty, lightweight, but not hugely expensive. Bath is about 60 miles away from Oxford. Tetbury is roughly two-thirds of the way from Oxford to Bath. Turned a hair. This is a phrase that the OED recognizes as having first been used in this story. It is when describing a horse that has gotten hot from working so much. Horse whose hair had turned would be a horse that was hot and sweaty, and you can kind of see the, the hair poking around and sticking up because it's gotten hot and sweaty. If a horse hadn't turned a hair, even though it had been working, it would be a horse that never broke a sweat. Curricles. Curricles are open carriages with two horses instead of one, so they're faster than a gig, but they're also heavier. So they had to be heavier to be able to withstand the, the pressure of being pulled by two horses. They can go faster. They would therefore have been more expensive than a gig. Carriages went over rough ground. That's just what they did. And so they took a lot of wear and tear. They also had to be really specially made. It was a really precision piece of work to put any kind of carriage together. And a curricle was going to have to have different and better suspension than a gig. So if you, for instance, have a gig and you want to, say, soup it up a little bit and make it a little extra something-something, you could perhaps add better suspension, pay somebody to add better suspension for you. You will hear the phrase curricle hung describing a gig. This is another thing that Jane Austen either invented or picked up and heard and was the first to have written down. Curricle hung doesn't evidently appear in any other writing, but the implication is, I've got this gig, check under the hood. Here, I got the suspension fixed up so it's curricle hung now. It's ready for action, baby cakes. And that is exactly the way it's being used. So one other thing about the carriages for you to file away for future jokeness. You will hear a character talking about how much money he paid for his gig. And he's really proud of himself and kind of bragging about how much he paid for it. Just so you know, a brand new one could have cost him only seven guineas more. So he's acting like he's, you know, fabulous businessman who knows how to buy and sell stuff. And really, he's kind of a putz about the money thing, which won't be news to you, but I wanted to make sure that you had in your mind a number for just how badly he blew the deal. Just, just a little fun for us. You'll hear a reference to Walcott Church. Uh, this is actually where her mother and father were married in 1764 and where her father was buried in 1805. The original medieval church was torn down, I believe, in between those two dates, and a new Georgian church was erected there, which is lovely. In a very non-Austinian move, Jane has a character curse in this book. I believe it's the only time a character does that in any of her books. There is a D with a line after it. Oh, D it. <laughs> D line it probably said damn was the implication. But you see, you have to pay attention to who is saying it to know why she would have a character do that. That, that alone probably tells you everything you need to know about the young man in her world. Oxford College is made up of lots of smaller colleges. You, you have heard different books that we've read talk about many of them. There's Maudlin Bridge and Maudlin College, which looks like it's spelled Magdalene. There's Oriel College, which you'll hear about in 
this book. There's Christchurch, the largest, and probably the college that's graduated the most people who attained some kind of fame historically. I think they have the longest roster of, hey, famous people. Oxford has a, a term called Hillary term. It goes from January to March. And we have lots of reasons to believe that right now it is February. So young men coming down from Oxford in February appear to be skipping out on classes. We're not sure yet. Offering to drive someone up to Lansdowne Hill in Bath would be asking them to accompany you to a really nice lookout point, a scenic view. Of all the Gothic novels that we will have heard of during the course of this book, The Most Lurid was written by a guy, Matthew Lewis, whose name irrevocably wound up connected to his most famous work of trash, I mean fiction, called The Monk. He, unlike Mrs. Radcliffe, he didn't give a plausible realistic explanation for the drama, the melodrama, the acts of evil that were done in his book. Uh, he actually had evil things happening. And so it became gothic, yes, but gothic guy books. There was no veneer of romance, capital R, or romance, lowercase r. It was just bad things done by bad people to other probably bad but slightly more innocent people. His name got so connected to his book that he was called Monk Lewis in the press, so he never lived it down. And from all reports that I could find, it's really not a very good book. It's not, it's not particularly well written, whereas The Mysteries of Udolfo is passable. As if you, if you managed to watch the, um, the video of the goth girl doing her book review, she quite liked it. So there you are. Slanginess, the word fun meant pretty much the same thing, but it was very much a slang term. So if somebody was saying, well, that should be a lot of fun, it's actually a slangy way to say that should be an enjoyable outing. It'd be kind of odd. Uh, the other thing is, again, the word quiz gets brought up towards the end of today's chapter seven. A quiz of a hat would be kind of an oddity, silly looking type of hat. And then the final pre-chapters note, the octagon room. We've done the upper and lower assembly rooms. We've done the pump room. We've done the pump yard. We've done all of these things. We haven't talked about the octagon room. The octagon room was at the upper assembly, and it's, it was really cool. It was a, a centralized location, octagonally shaped. I know it's shocking since it's called the octagon room. If you went off to, I believe it's the left, you would enter the ballroom. If you went off to the right, it would be the tea room. And if you went straight ahead, it would be the gentleman's card room. And so from this one centralized location, where, of course, one could see and be seen, you could get to whatever entertainment you were interested in getting to. It was a smart design and helped with traffic flow quite a bit. So let's listen to chapters six and seven of Northanger Abbey by Jane Austen, read for us by Mia Daguerre. Here we go. Chapter 6 The following conversation, which took place between the two friends in the pump room one morning, after an acquaintance of eight or nine days, is given as a specimen of their very warm attachment, and of the delicacy, discretion, originality of thought and literary taste, which marked the reasonableness of that attachment. They met by appointment, and as Isabella had arrived nearly five minutes before her friend, her first address naturally was, My dearest creature, what can have made you so late? I have been waiting for you at least this age. Have you indeed? I'm very sorry for it, but really I thought I was in very good time. It is but just one. I hope you've not been here long. Oh, these ten ages at least. I'm sure I've been here this half hour. But now let us go and sit down at the other end of the room and enjoy ourselves. I have a hundred things to say to you. In the first place, I was so afraid it would rain this morning, just as I wanted to set off. It looked very showery, and that would have thrown me into agonies. 
Do you know I saw the prettiest hat you can imagine in a shop window in Milsom Street just now? Very like yours, only with coquelicot ribbons instead of green. I quite longed for it. But my dearest Catherine, what have you been doing with yourself all morning? Have you gone on with Adolfo? Yes, I've been reading it ever since I woke, and I am got to the Black Veil. Are you indeed? How delightful! Oh, I would not tell you what's behind the Black Veil for the world. Are you not wild to know? Oh, yes, quite. What can it be? But do not tell me. I would not be told upon any account. I know it must be a skeleton. I'm sure it's Laurentina's skeleton. Oh, I am delighted with the book. I should not like to spend my whole life in reading it, I assure you. If it had not been to meet you, I would not have come away from it for all the world. Dear creature, how much I am obliged to you. And when you have finished Rodolfo, we will read the Italian together. And I have made out a list of ten or twelve more of the same kind for you. Have you indeed? How glad I am. What are they all? I will read you their names directly. Here they are in my pocket book. Castle of Wolfenbach, Claremont, Mysterious Warnings, Necromancer of the Black Forest, Midnight Bell, Orphan of the Rhine, and Horrid Mysteries. Those will last us some time. Yes, pretty well, but are they all horrid? Are you sure they are all horrid? Yes, quite sure. For a particular friend of mine, a Miss Andrews, a sweet girl, one of the sweetest creatures in the world, has read every one of them. I wish you knew Miss Andrews. You would be delighted with her. She's netting herself the sweetest cloak you can conceive. I think her as beautiful as an angel, and I'm so vexed with the men for not admiring her. I scold them all amazingly about it. Scold them? Do you scold them for not admiring her? Yes, that I do. There's nothing I would not do for those who are really my friends. I have no notion of loving people by halves. It's not my nature. My attachments are always excessively strong. I told Captain Hunt at one of our assemblies this winter that if he were to tease me all night I would not dance with him unless he would allow Miss Andrews to be as beautiful as an angel. The men think us incapable of real friendship, you know, and I'm determined to show them the difference. Now, if I were to hear anybody speaking slightly of you, I should fire up in a moment. But that is not at all likely, for you are just the kind of girl to be a great favourite with the men. Oh, dear, cried Catherine, colouring. How can you say so? I know you very well. You have so much animation, which is exactly what Miss Andrews wants. For I must confess there's something amazingly insipid about her. Oh, I must tell you that just after we parted yesterday, I saw a young man looking at you so earnestly. I'm sure he's in love with you. Catherine coloured and disclaimed again. Isabella laughed. It's very true upon my honour. But I see how it is. You are indifferent to everyone's admiration except for one gentleman who shall be nameless. Nay, I cannot blame you. Speaking more seriously, your feelings are easily understood. Where the heart is really attached, I know very well how little one can be pleased with the attention of anybody else. Everything is so insipid, so uninteresting that does not relate to the beloved object. I can perfectly comprehend your feelings. But you should not persuade me that I think so very much about Mr Tilney, for perhaps I may never see him again. Not see him again? My dearest creature, do not talk of it. I am sure you would be miserable if you thought so. No, indeed, I should not. I do not pretend to say that I was not very much pleased with him. But while I have Adolfo to read, I feel as if nobody could make me miserable. Oh, the dreadful black veil. My dear Isabella, I am sure there must be Laurentina's skeleton behind it. It is so odd to me that you should never have read Udolfo before, but I suppose Mrs Morland objects to novels. No, she does not. She very often reads Sir Charles Grandison herself, but new books do not fall in our way. Sir Charles Grandison? That is an amazing horrid book, is it not? I remember Miss Andrews could not get through the first volume. It is not like Udolfo at all, but yet I think it's very entertaining. Do you indeed? You surprise me. I thought it had not been readable. But my dearest Catherine, have you settled what to wear on your head tonight? I'm determined at all events to be dressed exactly like you. The men take notice of that sometimes, you know. But it does not signify if they do, said Catherine very innocently. Signify? Oh, heavens! I make it a rule never to mind what they say. They are very often amazingly impertinent. 
if you do not treat them with spirit and make them keep their distance. Are they? Well, I've never observed that. They always behave very well to me. Oh, they give themselves such airs. They are the most conceited creatures in the world and think of themselves of so much importance. By the by, though, I've thought of it a hundred times. I've always forgotten to ask you. What is your favourite complexion in a man? Do you like them best dark or fair? I, I hardly know. I've never much thought about it. Something between the both, I think. Brown, not fair, not very dark. Very well, Catherine. That is exactly here. I have not forgotten your description of Mr Tilney. A brown skin with dark eyes and rather dark hair. Well, my taste is different. I prefer light eyes and as to complexion, do you know, I like a sallow better than any other. You must not betray me if you should ever meet with one of your acquaintance answering that description. Betray you? What do you mean? Nay, do not distress me. I believe I've said too much. Let us drop the subject. Catherine, in some amazement, complied, and after remaining a few minutes silent, was on the point of reverting to what interested her at that time, rather more than anything else in the world, Laurentina's skeleton, when her friend prevented her by saying, "'For heaven's sake, let us move away from this end of the room. Do you know there are two odious young men who have been staring at me this half hour? They really put me quite out of countenance. Let us go and look at the arrivals. They will hardly follow us there.' Away they walked to the book, and while Isabella examined the names, it was Catherine's employment to watch the proceedings of these alarming young men. They're not coming this way, are they? I hope they're not so impertinent as to follow us. Pray let me know if they're coming. I'm determined I will not look up. In a few moments, Catherine, with unaffected pleasure, assured her that she need not be longer uneasy, as the gentleman had just left the pump room. And which way are they gone? said Isabella, turning hastily round. One was a very good-looking young man. They went towards the churchyard. Well, I'm amazingly glad I've got rid of them. And now, what say you going to Edgar's buildings with me and looking at my new hat? You said you would like to see it. Catherine readily agreed. Only, she added, perhaps we may overtake the two young men. Oh, never mind that. If we make haste, which we shall pass them by presently, and I'm dying to show you my hat. But if we only wait a few moments, there will be no danger of our seeing them at all. I shall not pay them any such compliment. I assure you I have no notion of treating men with such respect. That is the way to spoil them. Catherine had nothing to oppose against such reasoning, and therefore, to show the independence of Miss Thorpe and her resolution of humbling the sex, they set off immediately as fast as they could walk in pursuit of the two young men. Chapter 7 Half a minute conducted them through the pump yard to the archway, opposite Union Passage, but here they were stopped. Everybody acquainted with Bath may remember the difficulties of crossing Cheap Street at this point. It is indeed a street of so impertinent a nature, so unfortunately connected with the great London and Oxford roads, and the principal inn of the city, that a day never passes in which parties of ladies, however important their business, whether in quest of pastry, millinery, or even, as in the present case, of young men, are not detained on one side or the other by carriages, horsemen or carts. This evil has been felt and lamented at least three times a day by Isabella since her residence in Bath, and she was now fated to feel and lament it once more, for at the very moment of coming opposite to Union Passage, and within view of the two gentlemen who were proceeding through the crowds and threading the gutters of that interesting alley, they were prevented crossing by the approaching of a gig, driven along on bad pavement, by a most knowing-looking coachman, with all the vehemence that could most fitly endanger the lives of himself, his companion and his horse. "'Oh, these odious gigs!' said Isabella, looking up. How I detest them! But this detestation, though so just, was of short duration, for she looked again and exclaimed, Delightful! Mr. Morland and my brother! Good heavens, tis James! was uttered at the same moment by Catherine, and on catching the young man's eyes, the horse was immediately checked with a violence which almost threw him on his haunches, and the servant, having now scampered up, the gentleman jumped out, and the equipage was delivered to his care. Catherine, by whom this meeting was wholly unexpected, received her brother with the liveliest pleasure, 
and he, being of a very amiable disposition and sincerely attached to her, gave every proof on his side of equal satisfaction, which he could have leisure to do, while the bright eyes of Miss Thorpe were incessantly challenging his notice, and to her his devoirs were speedily paid, with a mixture of joy and embarrassment which might have informed Catherine, had she been more expert in the development of other people's feelings, and less simply engrossed by her own, that her brother thought her friend quite as pretty as she could do herself. John Thorpe, who in the meantime had been giving orders about the horses, soon joined them, and from him she directly received the amends which were her due, for while he slightly and carelessly touched the hands of Isabella, on her he bestowed a whole scrape and half a short bow. He was a stout man of middling height, who, with a plain face and ungraceful form, seemed fearful of being too handsome unless he wore the dress of a groom, and too much like a gentleman unless he were easy where he ought to be civil, and impudent where he might be allowed to be easy. He took out his watch. "'How long do you think we've been running it from Tetbury, Miss Morland?' "'I do not know the distance.' Her brother told her that it was twenty-three miles. Three and twenty, cried Thorpe. Five and twenty if it's an inch.' Morland remonstrated, pleaded the authority of road books, innkeepers, and milestones, but his friend disregarded them all. He had the surer test of distance. I know it must be five and twenty, said he, by the time we've been doing it. It is now half after one. We drove out of the inn yard at Tetbury as the town clock struck eleven, and I defy any man in England to make my horse go less than ten miles in harness. That makes it exactly twenty five. "'You have lost an hour,' said Morland. "'It was only ten o'clock when we came from Tetbury. Ten o'clock! It was eleven upon my soul. "'I counted every stroke. "'This brother of yours will persuade me out of my senses, Miss Morland. "'But do look at my horse. "'Did you ever see an animal so made for speed in your life?' "'The servant had just mounted the carriage and was driving off. "'Such true blood! Three hours and a half indeed, "'coming only three and twenty miles. "'Look at that creature and suppose it is possible if you can.' He does look very hot, to be sure. Hot? He had not turned a hair till we came to Walcott Church. But look at his forehead, look at his loins. Only see how he moves. That horse cannot go less than ten miles an hour. Tie his legs and he will get on. What do you think of my gig, Miss Morland? A neat one, is it not? Well hung, town built. I've not had it a month. It was built for a Christchurch man, a friend of mine, a very good sort of fellow. He ran it a few weeks, till I believe it was convenient to have done with it. I happened just then to be looking out for some light thing of the kind, though I had pretty well determined on a curricle too. But I chanced to meet him on Magdalen Bridge as he was driving into Oxford last term. Ah, Thorpe, said he, do you happen to want such a little thing as this? It's a capital one of the kind, but I'm cursed tired of it. Oh, damn, said I, I am your man. What do you ask, and how much do you think he did, Miss Morland? I'm sure I cannot guess at all. Curricle hung, you see, seat, trunk, sword case, splashing board, lamp, silver moulding, all you see, complete, the ironwork as good as new or better. He asked fifty guineas. I closed with him directly, threw down the money, and the carriage was mine. And I'm sure, said Catherine, I know so little of such things, that I cannot judge whether it was cheap or dear. Neither one nor t'other. I might have got it for less, I dare say, but I hate haggling. And poor Freeman wanted cash. "'That was very good-natured of you,' said Catherine, quite pleased. "'Oh, damn it! When one has means of doing a kind thing by a friend, I hate to be pitiful.' An inquiry now took place into the intended movements of the young ladies, and, on finding whither they were going, it was decided that the gentlemen should accompany them to Edgar's buildings and pay their respects to Mrs Thorpe. James and Isabella led the way, and so well satisfied was the latter with her lot— so contentedly was she endeavouring to ensure a pleasant walk to him who brought the double recommendation of being her brother's friend and her friend's brother. So pure and uncoquettish were her feelings that though they overtook and passed the two offending young men in Milsom Street, she was so far from seeking to attract their notice that she looked back on them only three times. John Thorpe kept, of course, with Catherine, and after a few minutes' silence, renewed the conversation about his gig. "'You will find, however, Miss Morland, it would be reckoned a cheap thing by some people, "'for I might have sold it for ten guineas more the next day. "'Jackson's of Oriel bid me sixty at once. "'Morland was with me at the time.' "'Yes,' said Morland, who overheard this. "'But you forget that your horse was included.' "'My horse? Oh, damn it, I would not sell my horse for a hundred. 
Are you fond of an open carriage, Miss Morland? Yes, very. I've hardly ever had an opportunity of being in one, but I'm particularly fond of it. I'm glad of it. I will drive you in mine every day. Thank you, said Catherine in some distress, from a doubt of the propriety of accepting such an offer. I will drive you up Lansdowne Hill tomorrow. Thank you, but will not your horse want to rest? Rest? He's only come three and twenty miles today. Oh, nonsense. Nothing ruins a horse so much as rest. Nothing knocks them up so soon. No, I shall exercise mine at an average of four hours every day while I'm here. Shall you indeed? said Catherine very seriously. That will be forty miles a day. Forty? Aye, fifty for what I care. Well, I will drive you up Lansdowne tomorrow. Mind, I'm engaged. How delightful that will be, cried Isabella, turning round. My dearest Catherine, I quite envy you, but I'm afraid, my brother, you will have no room for a third. A third? Indeed, no, no. But I did not come to Bath to drive my sisters about. That would be a good joke. Faith, Morland must take care of you. This brought on a dialogue of civilities between the other two, but Catherine heard neither the particulars or the result. Her companion's discourse now sunk from its hitherto animated pitch to nothing more than a short decisive sentence of praise or condemnation on the face of every woman they met. And Catherine, after listening and agreeing as long as she could, with all the civility and deference of the young female mind, fearful of hazarding an opinion of its own in opposition to that of the self-assured man, especially when the beauty of her own sex is concerned, ventured at length to vary the subject by a question which had been long uppermost in her thoughts. It was, Have you read Udolpho, Mr Thorpe? Udolpho? Oh, Lord, not I. I never read novels. I have something else to do. Catherine, humbled and ashamed, was going to apologise for her question, but he prevented her by saying, Novels are so full of nonsense and stuff. There's not been a tolerably decent one come out since Tom Jones, except The Monk. I read that t'other day, but as for all the others, they're the stupidest things in creation. I think you must like Adolfo if you were to read it. It is very interesting. Not I, Faith. No, if I read any, it shall be Mrs Radcliffe's. Her novels are amusing enough. They're worth reading. Some fun and nature in them. Odolfo was written by Mrs Radcliffe, said Catherine with some hesitation for the fear of mortifying him. No, sure, was it? Aye, I remember. So it was. I was thinking of that other stupid book written by that woman. They make such a fuss about. She, she who was married to a French emigrant. I suppose you mean Camilla. Yes, that is the book. Such unnatural stuff. An old man playing at seesaw. I took up the first volume once and looked it over, but I soon found out it would not do. Indeed, I guessed what sort of stuff it must be before I saw it. As soon as I heard she had married an emigrant, I was sure I would never be able to get through it. I have never read it. You had no loss, I assure you. It is the horridest nonsense you can imagine. There is nothing in the world in it but an old man's playing at seesaw and learning Latin. Upon my soul, there is not. This critique, the justness of which was unfortunately lost on poor Catherine, brought them to the door of Mrs Thorpe's lodgings, and the feelings of the discerning and unprejudiced reader of Camilla gave way to the feelings of the dutiful and affectionate son, as they met Mrs Thorpe, who had described them from above in the passage. "'Ah, oh, mother, how do you do?' said he, giving her a hearty shake of the hand. "'Where do you get that quiz of a hat? It makes you look like an old witch!' Here is Morland and I come to stay a few days with you, so you must look out for a couple of good beds somewhere near. And this address seemed to satisfy all the fondest wishes of the mother's heart, for she received him with the most delighted and exulting affection. On his two younger sisters, he then bestowed an equal portion of his fraternal tenderness, for he asked each of them how they did, and observed that they both looked very ugly. These manners did not please Catherine, but he was James's friend and Isabella's brother, and her judgment was further brought off by Isabella assuring her, when they withdrew to see the new hat, that John thought her the most charming girl in the world, and by John's engaging her before they parted to dance with him that evening. Had she been older or vainer, such attacks might have done little, but where youth and diffidence are united, it requires uncommon steadiness of reason to resist the attraction of being called the most charming girl in the world and being so very early engaged as a partner. And the consequence was that when the two Morlands, after sitting an hour with Thorpes, set off to walk together to Mr Allen's, and James, as the door was closed on them, said, Well, Catherine, how do you like my friend Thorpe? 
Instead of answering as she probably would have done had there been no friendship and no flattery in the case, I do not like him at all, she directly replied, I like him very much, he seems very agreeable. He's as good-natured a fellow as ever lived. A little of a rattle, but that will recommend him to your sex, I believe. And how do you like the rest of the family? Very, very much indeed, Isabella particularly. I'm very glad to hear you say so. She is just the kind of young woman I could wish to see you attached to. She has so much good sense and is so thoroughly unaffected and amiable. I always wanted you to know her and she seems very fond of you. She says the highest things in your praise that could possibly be. And the praise of such a girl as Miss Thorpe, even you, Catherine, taking her hand with affection, may be proud of. Indeed I am, she replied. I love her exceedingly. I am delighted to find that you like her too. You hardly mentioned anything of her when you wrote to me after your visit there. "'because I thought I should soon see you myself. "'I hope you will be a great deal together while you are in Bath. "'She's the most amiable girl, such a superior understanding. "'How fond all the family are of her. "'She's evidently the general favourite. "'But how much she must be admired in such a place as this, is not she?' "'Yes, very much indeed, I fancy. "'Mr. Allen thinks her the prettiest girl in Bath. "'I dare say he does.' "'and I do not know any man who's a better judge of beauty than Mr. Allen. "'I need not ask you whether you are happy here, my dear Catherine. "'With such a companion of friend as Isabella Thorpe, "'it would be impossible for you to be otherwise. "'And the Allens, I'm sure, are very kind to you. "'Yes, very kind. I never was so happy before. "'And now you are come, it will be more delightful than ever. "'How good it is of you to come so far on purpose to see me!' "'James accepted this tribute of gratitude,' and qualified his conscience for accepting it too by saying with perfect sincerity, Indeed, Catherine, I love you dearly. Inquiries and communications concerning brothers and sisters, the situation of Somme, the growth of the rest, and other family matters now passed between them, and continued, with only one small digression on James's part in praise of Miss Thorpe, till they reached Pulteney Street, where he was welcomed with great kindness by Mr and Mrs Allen, invited by the former to dine with them, and summoned by the latter to guess the price and weigh the merits of a new muffin tippet. A pre-engagement in Edgar's buildings prevented his accepting the invitation of one friend, and obliged him to hurry away as soon as he had satisfied the demands of the other. The time of the two parties uniting in the octagon room being correctly adjusted, Catherine was then left to the luxury of a raised, restless and frightened imagination over the pages of Adolfo, lost from all worldly concerns of dressing and dinner, incapable of soothing Mrs Allen's fear on the delay of an expected dressmaker, and having only one minute and sixty to bestow even on the reflection of her own felicity in being already engaged for the evening. All right, so we've met the two gentlemen, Young Thorpe and... Catherine's brother James. There are a couple things that I want to make sure you're aware of in retrospect. I just didn't want to load you down with too much about the horses and carriages uh, at the beginning. Thorpe says, I defy any man in England to make my horse go less than 10 miles an hour in harness. Well, that's interesting because it's kind of impossible. A single horse pulling a carriage could not, could not go 10 miles an hour. Truly, two horses pulling a chaise, which is just a little bit bigger than a gig, but it's enclosed, could maybe make seven to eight miles an hour if the roads were good. Therefore, James Moreland's calculation of how fast they were going and how fast the, the horses could go was probably a lot more accurate, which I know isn't a surprise, but I did want to give you the, the confidence that you were correct and that people who were reading the book at the time would have known James's estimation of how long it took them to drive the distance would indicate that the horses were going about six and a half miles an hour, far, far from 10. And in fact, if you hadn't already figured it out, pretty much everything Thorpe has said is complete hogwash. For example, horses can be very much harmed by overwork. And in fact, horses that were for hire at fast carriage transports where you could, you know, race in stagecoach like have your horses switched out and then race out again with a new team of horses, those horses frequently didn't last more than three years. So 
That was incorrect, what Thorpe said. Another indication that Thorpe is kind of not to be trusted is this. When he's talking about the book Camilla and indicating that he has read it, Catherine admits she has not. He says, you had no loss, I assure you. It is the horridest nonsense you can imagine. There's nothing in the world in it but an old man's playing at seesaw. This is true. In the beginning of the book, a older guy does get on a seesaw with a child. There's an accident. And learning Latin, which is also true. He was learning Latin. Upon my soul, there's not. There's nothing else in the book. Um, that's because both of those events happen in the first five chapters. It's five volumes long. It's so much longer than that. And Thorpe is, you know, one of those people who, Heather, read the first chapter, Heather, and the last chapter of a book, Heather, and thought for 20 years that she had therefore read the book. So, Heather. <laughs> oh, it's hard to see yourself portrayed back to you in a mirror like that. But Thorpe also does something else, which is very much gaslighting. It goes beyond the, I meant to do that. Pee Wee Herman line and goes far into the, oh, did I say the horse was doing 10 miles an hour? Well, of course not. No, you heard me wrong. It was actually going six miles an hour. Or the even worse, having said the horse was going 10 miles an hour. And then when it comes up again and they realize they have been corrected, saying, well, like I said, it was going six miles an hour. And then from that point on, believing, or at least pretending to believe, that that is, in fact, what they had said the whole time. This is a dangerous character in that respect, where lying becomes so routine that it is very, very likely he does not even notice it himself. And I don't know if you picked up on it, but Isabella did the same thing when she was talking to Catherine earlier in the, the chapters. She was talking about her friend, Miss Andrews, a sweet girl, one of the sweetest creatures in the world which was a colloquialism that was so used and reused that there's even a joke about that phrase in Sense and Sensibility. It's not the first time that Jane Austen has used this to point out some level of insipidity. How's that about someone? But here, she goes on at length. It's two big, good paragraphs about how awesome and wonderful Miss Andrews is. And then towards the end, and again, in Isabella's mind, casting herself as the heroine of a book, she says, Now, if I were to hear anybody speak slightingly of you, I should fire up in a moment. But that's not at all likely, for you are just the kind of girl to be a great favorite with the men. Oh, dear, cried Catherine, coloring. How can you say so? Because she's not a coquette. She is not getting the game that's being played here. Regardless, Isabella follows up with this. I know you very well. You have so much animation, which is exactly what Miss Andrews wants. Okay, she has been talking about Miss Andrews like she is the best thing since sliced bread, and then pivots. It's exactly what Miss Andrews wants. It's what she's lacking. For I must confess, there is something amazingly insipid about her. All of that good stuff about Miss Andrews just got eliminated. It may seem like a small thing, because... Austin pretty much drops that part of the conversation at that point. It is not a small thing. Austin doesn't waste those moments or words uh, in a situation like that. Those are being used to educate us about character. And speaking of, did you hear by the end of chapter seven, Catherine started Isabella Ing when her brother says, Isabella says the highest things in your praise that could possibly be, and the praise of such a girl as Miss Thorpe, even you, Catherine, taking her hand with affection, may be proud of. And she says, Indeed I am, she replied. I love her exceedingly, and I'm delighted to find that you like her too. I love her exceedingly is not how Catherine spoke at the beginning of the book. We will see that waver in and out for a while. Jane Austen, man, she does a good job. It shows that she put time, lots of time, into building this book. I hope you are enjoying it. I will be back next week with chapters eight and nine of Northanger Abbey. Until then, be well, take care of yourself, take care of each other, wear a mask. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. If you like what you hear on Craftlit, please review us on 
iTunes, like us on Facebook, join in the fun in our Facebook group, which is Craft Lit Annotated Audiobooks. Always the nicest group of people you're going to find on Facebook and the place where you can come to and say, nobody else was going to understand this, but I knew you all would. And of course, thank you for your support of Craftlet. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on.